back everyone. Um, next up, uh, we have Mohamed Falak talking about uh, eBPF 101. Uh, Mohamed Falak is a software engineer who is interested in how the eBPF subsystem uh, can be leveraged in novel ways to enable new use cases. Uh, please welcome Mohamed Falak. Hello. So this is uh, eBPF 101 talk. I hope everybody can hear me all right. So the idea is that we only have 20 minutes, 20 or 25 odd minutes and plus questions. So what we're going to do is we're not going to do any programming sort of learning what's how to program the EBPF subsystem, but it's a, it's an overview from a perspective of a non kernel programmer of what this EBPF subsystem means, because there's been lately a lot of buzz around the EBPF subsystem. So a little bit about me. Who am I? I recently finished this, this cool book, pretending to be a Linux kernel expert, pun intended. I come from a very beautiful part of the world called Srinagar, Kashmir. And uh, yeah, I am no way an expert in all of this. I just am reading it for fun and trying to you know, leverage it and use it in my own day job and try and do more experiments with it. So yeah, let's look at the agenda. So first of all, <clears throat> we are going to look at the history of what this BPF thingy is. And then we are going to move to the more recent, the current parts of the eBPF, where the E comes from. So without further ado, let's get started. So let's go back in time, probably to the 90s, and assume that there's no TCP dump. And we want to design a packet filter. So what could be our sort of design goals are to design a packet filter which copies or gives us a way to look at every packet that goes out through the wire and inspect it so how could we implement it there are generally two ways these are not exhaustive ways but generally there are two ways one could be you copy everything that goes throughout the wire to user space and then apply a filter on that of whatever is interesting to you, whatever is not. The other way could be more optimal, where you write a kernel module and you say, if X is the destination port, X is the source, Y is the source port, blah, blah, blah. You load that module in the kernel. It only copies the packets, what you wanted to look at, were interesting to you. But again, we, we are going to talk about the trade-offs involved. So What's the problem here? If we have the user space implementation, we copy everything. It's, it's like a no brainer. You copy everything, what goes on to the wire, to the user space, and then you do what you need to do with that. In the kernel space, if you implemented that module thing, what would have happened? You hard code whatever you wanted to look at what was interesting for your use case, and then only that thing gets copied to the user space and you take a look at it. At the end of the day, you have to copy stuff to the user space. The only optimization that we are looking at is how much do you copy? And uh, if you look at if you look at the trade-offs here, in the user space thingy, it is not optimal. And the kernel module thing, it is pretty optimal because it just copies what you want, and you're not doing more than more work than it's required. The user space implementation is a generic solution. You can implement it once, sort of have that switch in the driver or whatever, <clears throat> and just, just be done with it. Whenever you want to do some TCP dump thingy, you just nudge the driver, it copies everything to your user space, and then you do the packet processing and then apply filters. For example, there are 100 packets copied. You could only sort of, the interesting ones could be only three or four. In the kernel side, you only copy the three drivers, but this solution is not generic because you had hard coded or you had written the module and uh, it only would apply for that destination and that 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 that, that destination port and that that whatever protocol you're looking at there's one more interesting case here is the user space solution is a little safer when we say safe i mean if there's a bug in your code what worse could go i mean what could go wrong you basically could have a seg fault in the user space that's not too bad uh, but nothing's going to go too bad but if the kernel module had a bug the whole system is going down probably i mean the sanity of the system is in question so wh what would be the right way to do things here 
Yeah, I mean, what if we had best of the both both of the worlds? Like we had like a generic solution and an optimal performance. So what would that kind of a design be? I mean, how, how would you how would you do it? So in 1992, the BSD packet filter, this paper, it's a seminal paper that was published where the folks designed a novel architecture to do exactly the same thing of, of how do we implement TCP dump and do it optimally. So they had, they had an in, in, in interesting design choice. What they did is they implemented a VM, a simple VM which resides in the kernel and it just could not do much. It just does a bunch of loads, a bunch of stores, a little bit of jumping, ar jumping around, very basic arithmetic operations, returns, and it had like an accumulator register and one more like X register so you could do transfer one instruction, I mean, data from the accumulator to the X register or maybe from the X register to the accumulator register. Nothing fancy at all. So you have basically, a VM that resides in the kernel and you you operate that and you do something with that which will come to shortly so okay now you you what you've done is you've created a VM you've dumped it inside the kernel but how do you run a PPF program okay let's take a digression first I mean how do user space programs work you could have a compiled program or you could have an interpreted program for compiled programs, you write the piece of code, then you give it to the compiler, plus the linker, you get a binary out of it, and then you go ahead and you run the binary. And everything sort of, you get the output. You wanted to write a hello world program, you write the source code, compile plus link it, and do an a dot out, dot slash a dot out, whatever, and it, it just prints it on the screen. You as a programmer, or whoever wants to use the program, has the control on when the program runs. In the interpreted case, similar thing, you write the code, you hand it over to the interpreter, it jits out the instructions and then executes them. But how do you do it in the PPF side? Because the PPF VM is inside the kernel. I mean, you don't have control over the kernel. You can't willy-nilly just go and run whatever you want in the kernel. The only interfaces you have with the kernel is the syscall or maybe some interrupts, but generally it's just the syscall. So do you have a direct way of nudging the kernel to run a program? Probably, I mean, would that make sense? We'll, we'll look at it. So how does a BPF program run? BPF programs, it's very important to note that BPF programs, unlike the normal programs, are not dependent upon the programmer or whoever wants to use them. They do not run on his wish. They are mostly event driven. So there are a bunch of events in the kernel that are placed or a bunch of hook points in the kernel. And whenever you write a EBF, EBPF program or a BPF program, you write that in the instruction set, that, that, that simple instruction set, you target for that VM, you load the kernel via, you load the program via a syscall into the kernel, it still will not run because you just have loaded the program. Then you attach it to a particular hook point. So let's let's actually look at it. The BPF programs are stateless. That's an interesting point to note that these programs are very simple. They run to co completion and you load them to the kernel. You, you, you first of all write the filter expression. The filter expression is pretty simple. It's it's like here, we are going to go through this in a short while, but you write like eventual answer should be true or false. You load the bytecode in the kernel. You attach the loaded program to a hook. A hook could be, for example, every received packet is a hook. Whenever kernel receives a packet, run this PPF program. And the programs are event driven and they run to completion. There's no sort of preemption or anything that happens with it. A EBPF event occurs. The BPF program runs to completion, and at the end, it tells you yes or no. I mean, and that Boolean instruction, uh, that Boolean return value, can be used to do very interesting sort of things. So let's let's take a small example of a very very simple BPF program that that that, that comes via the paper. I've just copied it from the paper, and this this program here is 
basically a program that just filters out IP packets and which go to a particular destination port. So if you see, I'm doing a load half word of the 12th offset in the packet. So every packet, when it comes, it has a particular, like the standard, it has a particular format. And what you go is you start with the packet starting and then go to the 12th offset and see, is it Ethernet protocol? And if it is, then jump to L1. Otherwise, L5, zero. I mean, I don't want to do anything with it because it's not Ethernet. I don't know what it is. So get out. Then you do a load byte on the 23rd offset of the whatever packet you had, and then see if it's TCP. If it is TCP, you go to the this part of the program. Otherwise, you just do the packet on the floor. And then you keep on munging a bunch of these small, small instructions that you do with it. So here, for example, the interesting one is you load if, if this is an IP packet, like the IP header, the length of the IP header here, this, this part is the length of the IP header. I mean, it's not too interesting of how exactly this happens, but it's, it's just as a notion here that these are very simple instructions that you can do on a packet receive, and then you, know, you return true or false. And depending on that result, you could have that if it's true, I'm gonna copy it to user space. If it's not, I'm not gonna copy it to user space. So this is basically what's the VM and how do you how do you write a BPF program and then load it inside the kernel and then make it run. Uh, before we move any further to the E part of the BPF, where does the E come from? We we need to look at some of the ideas that are similar to BPF. This is interesting and of course it, it's it's a little orthogonal, but it helps me to make make sense of why do we need BPF at the first place. So think of it as the embedded Lua VM in Nginx to modify behavior, for example, to check certain headers. If there is a certain header in the HTTP request, uh, allow it. And if there is none, just drop it on the floor. Now, th there, were, there were two ways of doing this kind of thing. Either you could pull the Nginx source code and then add that piece of code in the C language, whatever language Nginx is written in, and then compile it. And whenever you have to do anything, you have to modify that rule, you always have to recompile, change and recompile. Uh, I, I, I think that's a little unwieldy if you want to do these kind of things. And having a Lua VM embedded inside the Nginx module, it helps you a lot. Maybe uh, NeoVim, I, I don't think if I want to extend the functionality of my editor, I would want to pull the source code in, add that bunch of functionality inside the source code. I would rather write a Lua plugin and then load it in the, so so these are, these are some of the things where it tells us that it's probably easier to use the VM-based approach where you don't have to recompile all the program and start from zero. And uh, it's, it's working out great. I mean, I haven't forgotten about Emacs folks. Emacs, there are two ways to modify Emacs, either you modify the source code or you write Emacs Lisp, your init.el, whatever. So this this sort of this sort of notion is, is pretty prevalent these days and it's pretty pretty easy to use. Uh, it, it sometimes becomes a little difficult to think in the sense of kernel that okay, why are we not changing the kernel? But we are in, introducing a certain VM inside the kernel and increasing complexity. But if you look at it, if you compare it with other things, it's pretty normal that you have your own plugins and everything written in a different language than what the original editor or whatever target you were planning to use it on was. And it, it gives you a lot of flexibility and a lot of the turnaround time is pretty quick. So now let's move on to eBPF. So absolutely, we need to introduce ourselves to the eBPF mascot, which is the cute bee. So where did this extended or E in the BPF thingy come from? Alexi sent a patch close to 2013, 2014-ish, where he improved the existing BPF infrastructure in the kernel. The BPF infrastructure was already in the kernel and the prime users for that was TCP dump because that's why it was sort of gotten into the kernel. It started off from BSD, but then it was very soon ported to Linux. And uh, if we recall, 
the BSD packet filter just had hook points inside the network stack only. I mean, all the hook points were embedded there just for the network stack, nothing else. What Alexi's patch did is, first of all, improved the VM quality. I mean, earlier, if we remember, we looked at the instructions. There were just a few instructions, uh, a very small set of registers to work with. This patch vastly improved on that by making uh, improvements in the number of registers you have, the number of instructions you could implement and sort of write, and overall performance. So this this makes it E. This this adds the E. And then you have hook points spread throughout the Linux kernel. It is not only the network stack that has the hook points. There is a bunch of other places where the hook points are. So yeah, by the way, if, if I if I was not clear, if, if there are any questions, please feel free to ask them. Uh, and now we have to talk a little about uh, the C BPF or the old style BPF, which is also called as the classical BPF and extended BPF. So there are there are differences between the C BPF, the classical style of BPF and the extended style of BPF. The C BPF, typically a very constrained VM, will not let you do very interesting things while as ebpf is the extended one which has hook points throughout the kernel you could do a bunch of things with it earlier you could only do sort of packet processing decisions with the classical bpf but with ebpf you could do much more for example you could have a hook point on every system call that's executed and what one could do is whenever a certain program does a system call you could have a hook point and a bpf program attached to that hook point a program did a syscall since the hook point is attached to the syscall event it gets fired you check whether this particular program is allowed to make the syscall for example uh, a small application like a cat like application that just has work to get you know file data which is the read system call and dump it on the screen or probably redirect to a file does not have to do anything with the network socket IO calls. And if, for example, for some reason you could see malicious behavior, you could deny that. So the security aspect of it is very interesting. And you could also have hook points in there's there is there there are certain points in the kernel called K probes, K red probes, trace points. These are again uh hooks where a certain function executes there's a there's an event attached to that so you could get a lot of telemetry data from it and if you if you look very closely you could see there's this penguin as well as the windows sign so ebpf nowadays runs generally on most of the platforms that are available and windows was the most recent addition like 2020ish was the Thing that it started to come up and it, it, it can run on Windows. Of course, you can't run Linux specific things on like eBPF things on Windows, but generally the idea is there, the VM is there. So again, the capabilities. Networking, absolutely, it's it's where it started from. You could do a lot of networking stuff with eBPF. You could do a lot of security stuff. You could, like we talked about, you could have BPF program which has a hook point and just looks at a policy of whether a program is allowed to do a certain syscall or not. You could do a lot of observability. Like if you have those hook points where the trace points and the K probes, you could get a you could gather a bunch of information from the system dynamically by attaching the eBPF program. Whenever the hook fires, you get that information. All the processing is done inside the kernel and then finally you get the answer. Now why this is fast because since you have a VM inside the kernel, you want to count how many syscalls happened at a point X or I mean from A to B time. What you could do is you could write that code and then have internally the eBPF program gather all the details, do all the number crunching. And then finally, when you're done, it just spits out the answer back to the user space. Uh, copying data from across the user space and kernel space boundaries is costly so we want to do it as little as possible and want to keep the 
number crunching as local to where the data actually is and we just only want to look at the data so an interesting thing of the ebpf verifier and JIT is you can't really willy nilly run any program inside the ebpf vm or the linux kernel i mean when we talk about arbitrary program we talk about like we do that that very restricted set of instructions that were given that the ebpf vm runs but you really cannot do anything because the ebpf program runs to completion now what if a malicious user put an infinite loop in that whenever an event fires the cbpf program is going to go and then just infinitely loop and since the program runs to completion you basically just starve the cpu you did a denial of service because now there's no way for the system to yield the, the program it just runs in the ebpf so bpf verifier looks at whenever you load the ebpf program that you've written inside the kernel via the bpf system call <clears throat> it first of all goes to the verifier the verifier looks at all possible branches and whatever you have done in your code and first of all verifies the sanity of the program if the program according to the EPPF verifier is sane then only it gets handed over to the JIT compiler which then emits out native instructions for whatever architecture you're running on and then it moves along and does whatever it needs to do then you probably attach it to a particular hook point because just loading the program in the kernel is not going to do anything when you load a program in the kernel you have to attach it to a certain point and uh, then you do whatever you want to do with it so let me look at the questions since ppf verifier evolves can we expect that a ppf program written today for 5.16 will work in a few years okay so i think <clears throat> If, if, we, uh, if we if we if we look at the if we if we look at the architecture of the BPF VM, it's generally very simple. So if by what you mean is if you've written a program today and you have used trace points and you have not you have not relied yourself on API in the kernel that changes. For example, uh, we talked about K probes and trace points. Unfortunately, I do not have enough time to talk about what those are, but trace points have a guarantee of being more rigid, like system calls. They're not going to, they're going to survive multiple kernel versions, but K probes don't give you that because that's the internal kernel functions, and whenever the name of the function changes, the K probe changes. So if you if you use or leverage those kind of techniques where you use K trace points instead of K probes, probably yeah, the eBPF program should survive multiple kernel revisions. Can eBPF store state between system calls? Okay, yeah, sure, that's an excellent question. I'm gonna to come to it. So, what are the different types of eBPF programs? Recall, in the classical eBPF sense, it was only sort of relatively constrained towards the socket filter or the network stack. But in the extended sense, it's just spread throughout the kernel. So we're gonna talk about a little interesting of those some of the interesting this is not an exhaustive list so this bpf prog type sock filter what is this this is basically a packet filter the thing that the original bpf vm started with you apply a filter at a particular socket that okay if this is this destination port this source address this source port blah 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 do something there's another one called <clears throat> xdp the bpf prog type xdp this is an interesting one <clears throat> i'm sorry this is an interesting one because xdp is express data path and this is a bpf program which is attached at a hook point which is as close to the device driver as possible now we have to talk a little about it so i'm going to give one minute to it so what happens here is whenever the packet comes to your nick card it first of all gets stored on your nick's memory and then from the nick and uh, nick network interface card and from the network interface card it gets dma'd inside the linux kernel main memory and then you raise a soft irq and interrupt and then you you tell the linux kernel that hey i got a packet for you start processing it you know take it into your levels of bureaucracy of the network stack where you first of all you know plug the 
L2 header, then the L3 header, and then you keep on moving it up the stack. And finally, you do all sorts of, you know, net, net filter, that kind of table manipulations. And if all is green, you give it to if it's for destined to your process or if it was destined for some routing. This XTP is interesting because the moment a packet arrives on your NIC card and it's DMA'd, you raise a soft IRQ request with the NAPI interface, like the internal network stack. You have a capability to run a program. Now, at that point in time, your packet is just a buffer. It's not even an SK buff yet. It's just a buffer. You can do all sorts of crazy things there. You could redirect a program. You could drop it on the floor and you'd say, I, mean, I could do that with IP tables. Why do I need to do something there? Well, if you do that with IP tables, it happens much higher up the lane. I mean, it happens like after you've done the L2 and the L3 things. So you have to allocate a lot of space for it, for a packet that you probably did not want. So you could do that <clears throat> right when you receive that packet. And if you were acting as a router or a forwarder, you could straight away ask the BPF program, in this case, XTP, to you know do something with it, forward it via some other interface. One interesting other thing that could be done here at this point is, you could do a kernel bypass. Like you got the buffer, just leave the kernel. I don't want to go through the network stack, just straight away deliver it to the user space and I want to do whatever I want to do with it, like a raw socket thingy. The K probe trace point sock ops are, are similar and there are, there are much more. Now, recall the classical BPF was entirely stateless. eBPF as well is stateless. You can't really store state, but it has the capability to access storage which are called BPF maps. Now, these maps are not, not like actually a key value pair, but whenever we say eBPF map, think of it as storage, eBPF storage. So a BPF map is basically a generic data structure that allows you to pass data to and fro from the user to the kernel and inside the kernel. So you create a BPF map by using the same BPF syscall, which is a multi-tool, which lets you do a lot of things. Let's you load a program, attach a program to a particular hook point, create a map, attach a map to a certain place, do all sorts of things with the map. And a few interesting map types are a map type hash, which is actually like a key value store, a map type array, which is just like a normal array, a map type prog array, which stores file descriptors of a bunch of EBF programs that you've loaded and a bunch of other maps. Recently, there was a map type plume filter that was added. So you could do a bunch of state state stuff inside the kernel, but this state is global. Like since the EBVF program comes in, it can access that map, do whatever it needs to do. It does not store any state of its own, but it can do whatever it needs to do in the state and then finally just die. So I hope that answers the question. Uh, can EBPF store state between calls, smoothing the input from pen? Uh, I I think I, I talked about how, how does it store state, but probably we can take that offline because we are pretty short on time. And yeah, what's the conclusion? EBPF programs are not controlled by the programmer, but they run in response to events. EBPM programs run to completion. Now, an interesting thing here was I had put a bracket here and I'd said that they're not preemptive, but then one friend of mine, his name is Karthik, he's one of the EBPF developers, he sort of sends patches regularly. He corrected me and said that probably they can be preempted, but not migrated. So I, I just left that. So that's food for thought. I myself don't know much about it, but just, just saying it. Running an EBPF program is much safer than running and maintaining a kernel module. Now. What does that mean? If somebody gave me a kernel module and said that, yeah, this does an amazing, solves an amazing problem, can you run it in your production environment? I'd be very skeptical because me running a kernel module in production given by somebody, it's, it's, it's a little dangerous. But on the other hand, if somebody gave me an eBPF program, I would very well just try it out and probably not in production but at least I'll, I'll not be that hesitant because i know the app verifier is going to help me and not cause any problems the entry bar to get useful information from the kernel is significantly reduced people like me who don't know anything about the kernel or probably are sort of pretending to be kernel experts can can sort of know a lot about how the kernel works and the overhead is just pay as you go zero cost abstraction style i mean if you're using it that's the only time you pay for it 
it's it's minimal but still you have to pay for it and uh, the bpf em is already there so yeah thank you and i think we are right on time thank you very much um for luck uh, for that excellent introduction um, unfortunately, we are at the end of the time slot, so we don't have time for more questions. Uh, if you do have more questions, feel free to uh, contact Falak offline um, outside of the session, and I'm sure he'll be more than happy to keep talking uh, about eBPF. Um,